extra, extra, read all about experiment. Today, I thought I would do like a whirlwind overview of a broad array of biochemistry and molecular biology experiments, most of which I've actually done. I realized when I was cleaning up all my stuff from my PhD that I have learned a ton of different types of experiments. And I have, as in the process of, of learning all of these, I've been making posts and videos and that sort of thing. So I want to direct you guys to those as well as walk you through when you might want to use various techniques. So we're talking everything from gels to cloning to pure protein expression, protein purification, all sorts of various techniques that can come in really, really handy. Um, and so I am so grateful for all of these techniques that I have learned and I'm excited to learn even more in my postdoc, which I start in just over a week. Um, so I am not going to have as much time to post as frequently and that sort of thing. So I've been working on really organizing all of my content to make it easier to find. And so I will post links to all of these various pages and playlists and things too um but in the future it'll be doing a lot of refreshing old posts um reposting old things as i learn new things and then teach you about those as well so this is my blog for anyone who hasn't seen it uh the bumblingbiochemist.com and so under let's talk science i have this page of lab techniques so I have, and I have a separate page that we'll go through next where I have my protein expression and purification posts. So if you're looking for where those are, um, don't worry, they're coming. Okay, so let's talk about some basic lab techniques. A lot of times in the lab, we want to study molecules such as DNA, RNA, and protein. Those are the main ones that we, that we study at least um, in the majority of labs. Some labs work with like lipids and others work with carbohydrates and that sort of thing. I'm not gonna really talk about those much, but the main three are going to be your proteins and your nucleic acids, so your DNA and your RNA. And when you want to study these, you often want to separate them um, by their size. And you can do this using gel electrophoresis. The basic idea of any sort of gel electrophoresis is that you have a gel. So it's this like gel mesh. So there you can have a make of this mesh out of polyacrylamide in the case of a page gel. So polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, or in the case of like an agarose gel, your gel is going to be made out of the sugar agarose. And then you're going to use electricity to send these molecules traveling through this gel. And they're going to separate based on their size or based on their length. And, their, um, and so when we want to do a gel, we want to unfold them and coat them with a negative charge so that they're going to be able, they're going to be like compelled to travel through the gel. And then they're going to get tangled up as they go. And so the bigger ones are going to get tangled up uh, more. And so they're going to travel more slowly. The difference between these different types of gels is how you prepare the samples, what type of samples you're using, and what your gel is made of. So with proteins, we're typically doing an SDS page. So SDS is sodium dodecyl sulfate, and it's a detergent that's negatively charged. And so it's going to unfold and coat these proteins in this negative charge that's going to allow them to travel by their length. You want to do this typically because if proteins have shapes, and they have charge. And so these can both influence how they're going to travel through the gel. And so you want to unfold them and coat them all uniformly so that they're traveling based on their like linear length. So the number of amino acid letters that they have. If you want to study their if you want to know more about like their shape or who they're traveling with. So when you do this, you're also breaking up any interactions between proteins. If you run a native page, there you're not using the SDS. Instead, you are um, using their natural shape and their natural charge and stuff. If your protein isn't negatively charged enough, you can run what's called a blue, pa blue native page. And this is actually going to use a dye that's going to negatively coat things, but more but in a gentle manner that isn't going to interfere with the complex formation. So when you do a native page, you can tell things like are proteins running together as a complex? Are the proteins um, folded differently? Are there various things like that, that you can tell with a native page that you wouldn't be able to tell with an SDS page. When you're talking about separating DNA, so both of these were we were using for the protein. When we talk about DNA, we're often using an agarose gel. In an agarose gel, your gel is made up of the sugar agarose. You're going to have bigger pores 
good for separating really long thing, um, like big pieces of DNA. And but the principles are going to be the same, except that you don't need to worry about um, giving them a negative charge because DNA already has a negatively charged backbone. If you want to study smaller pieces of DNA or RNA, so I study um, small pieces of RNA. And so I found a lot of urea page. So here it is a page gel. So it's made out of polyacrylamide like we have with SDS page. But in this case, the gel contains urea. Urea is going to play a kind of similar role to the SDS in that it's going to coat the um, it's going to coat the RNA and prevent it from having secondary structure, from having these loops and stuff that could interfere with the travel. But the basic principles are the same. A key distinction between the, your, the, the page gels and the agarose gels. So one is just how they look. So the, the page gels are typically going to be run in a vertical format in between like two thin glass plates. And it's gonna be a really thin gel that's held up based on these plates. When you're talking about an agarose gel, this is typically in a horizontal slab. And um, so you don't have to have plates holding it up. You just have like a um, caster on the bottom. They're also differ in their makeup. Um, so when you're and how you actually make them. So you can buy these um, page gels precast, or you can make their, your own. When you make your own, what you're actually doing is you're actually doing the polymerization. So you're taking these acrylamide monomers, so these individual units, and you're actually adding um, chemicals that are going to cross-link it. Um, catalyze this radical cross-linking reaction, where these are going to link together to form this mesh. And when you make your own, you can customize the amount of meshiness you want. You can also buy different percentage meshes. Like, so if you have a little things that you want to separate, you want to use a higher percentage gel. This is going to have a um, smaller pores, so it's good for separating small things. If you have big things that you want to separate, you want to have bigger pores, and so you want a smaller percentage because the percentage is telling you about how much of the cross-linking and stuff there is. So the more of that there is, the tighter the pores are going to be. Um, you can also get like gradient gels, which have a range of different um, percentages. Um, okay, if you have, that's good for if you have like a range of protein sizes. Contrast that to agarose gels. With an agarose gel, you're actually, you're not doing any polymerization. You already have these chains. Instead, it's just like this jellification where you, you heat it up and you kind of like untangle all these chains. And then when you cool it down, it's going to um, kind of form this mesh. And again, you can use different percentages. Here are your percentages, instead of cross percentage of a cross link, you're talking about percentage of agarose. And so the higher the percentage, the um, smaller the pores are going to be, so the better for smaller nucleic acids. And so you can then um, customize based on the size of your things in any of these cases, but you have, they're made up of different things. So this is how we can separate based on their size. But if once, and so once we turn off the electricity, they'll have traveled different distances because the longer things will have gotten tangled up more, travel more slowly, be higher up on our gel. But of course we need a way to be able to actually see them. Typically what we're doing is we want to stain everything that's there. Like, so we want to see all the protein with an all protein stain, or we want to see all the DNA or all the RNA with some sort of fluorescent nucleic acid stain. So with proteins, we're often doing a comasi based gel. So comasi brilliant blue. There are both classical methods where you're doing like a fixed step um, where you're actually getting the protein stuck in and then you have a separate stain step and a de-stain step, or you have your fix and your stain steps combined, um, but then you have a de-stain step because when you're doing this fixation, you have this blue dye that's gonna basically stain the whole gel and you can't see any bands. So it's gonna bind to the proteins and then turn the, pro because it's blue, it's, the proteins will look blue. Um, but in order to see that, you have to wash everything out. There are also like colloidal based methods. Um, so a colloid is like this little kind of groups of these dye molecules. Well, it doesn't have to be a dye molecule, but in this case, they're colloids of the dye molecules. And so those colloid forms can't go in, but the monomer forms can, so like the individual ones. So you have some of the colloids, some of the individual dye molecules are gonna come out and come into the gel. And so basically you have less background. And so this is the basis of a lot of the like fast stains, um, or the quick stains, and then you don't have to de-stain them. 
For fluorescent nucleic acid, for nucleic acid stains, you're also you're often doing um, some sort of fluorescent stain, and so you can. The classic one is ethidium bromide. Um, so it's gotten a, a pretty bad rap because it's this like it can intercalate between DNA bases. So basically, you know, pun intended there, it can slip in between the bases of DNA, um, and this allows it to bind. And because it absorbs UV light, it's going to give it. Uh, we're going to be able to measure that absorbance. Um, and because it intercalates like this, it's been um, thought to be like, it's been given a bad rap as being car potentially like carcinogenic, so cancer causing. But the truth is you'd have to use a ton, a ton, you'd have to be exposed to a lot, a lot, a lot of it uh, without safety precautions and stuff. So it's not as dangerous as you might think to work with. Um, there are a lot of other stains as well. Some of these are like thought to, like advertised as being safer or something, um, but often we don't, I mean, there's not really that much of a difference between them. And there's, again, this isn't as bad as it seems. But anyway, with either case, you want to wear gloves and do all the typical safety precautions. Um, but in the bulk of things, like just don't just be careful and don't like eat this sort of thing, but don't be like afraid working with it is my key thing and more on the post in it. But the basic idea is it's going to bind to the DNA and then you can shine light on it of one wavelength that it likes. And then it's going to give back, um, shine off a different wavelength. And so then you can measure it because it's going to bind just where the things are in the gel. And you can either incorporate this, the stain in some of them, like Easy Vision dye, it has it like actually in the loading dye. Other times you put it in the gel, other times you soak the gel afterwards. So lots of different ways to stain the gel or stain the bands. Okay, so, but with these techniques, we're basically, we're staining everything that's there. And it's not, it, we can learn about the size because we can run like a si molecular weight ladder. So like proteins or DNA of known sizes that we can then compare the position of the bands that we see to the position in the ladder. But it's not telling you about the actual um, identity of the product that's actually there. If we want to know about the identity, then we can do other things. When we're talking about a protein, one of the most common things that you see done is a Western blot. The basic idea with the Western blot is that you're going to take that gel, that, that SDS page gel you just ran, or it can be a native page, and then you're going to transfer those proteins out of the gel and onto a membrane. You're then going to um, probe this membrane with an antibody that recognizes the protein and this of your that you're looking for in this way if that protein is present you're going to be able to visualize it much more on this in the western blot um, post but basically you're probing for a specific protein of interest and so you'll only see a signal if that protein is there if you want to look for things other than proteins um, or you want to look for proteins that bind various things, whatever, um, there's basically there's a lot of different versions of blocks. And the basic idea with the plot is that you put, you're transferring things out of a gel onto a membrane, typically a gel, onto some sort of membrane that you can then probe with various things. And so if you want to look for proteins, then you're probing with antibodies typically. If you want to look for DNA or RNA, then you can probe with a oligonucleotide probe. So basically radio labeled, radioactively labeled um, DNA or RNA pieces. Um, and so I have a post on how you actually radio label those probes as well. But you can, because of the base to base complementarity, you can use the probes. And so um, a couple of the really common ones are Northern blot, and this is going to look for RNA using DNA. So you'd run some sort of like urea page or some other um, gel like that with your RNA, and then you transfer that to a membrane and blot it using DNA probes. Um, and the Southern blot, this is actually the original blot where you have DNA, so you'd run like a, either some sort of page or agarose gel, transfer that DNA onto a membrane and then probe it with DNA. There are also a bunch of different other methods. Um, in my post on the blots, I go over in most detail the Northern and the Southern, but there are other ones where you're looking for um, other types of things. Okay, so with a lot, so the Northern and the Southern, a lot of they use the these techniques, although they're still used in certain cases, they've been often supplement, sub, 
superseded, supplanted um, by the PCR-based methods. So PCR, polymerase chain reaction, is a way that you can make lots of copies of a specific sequence of DNA. And so how it works is that you use these short pieces of DNA called primers, and you design these primers so that they bookend the region of the DNA that you want copied. And then the DNA polymerase is going to copy this region. You then heat up the strands to um, melt them, so pull the strands apart so that the new pr more primers can bind. And then you get this, um, then doing this, um, amplifying the region because each time the primer, each cycle, you're going to get another copy made. And then each of those copies can be used to make another copy and over and over and over. Um, and so much more on PCR here and as well as in the, um, if you, just some various things about PCR and how to optimize various things like that. And often when you do a PCR, you are then going to do some sort of PCR purification or cleanup. And so with these like mini, um, these spin columns. Um, so I have a post on that too. But getting back to why this would be helpful was if you have a sequence present, then you're gonna be able to make copies of it. And if, so this is another way to see things because if that sequence is not present, then you're not gonna be able to make copies. If you're going, you can use like um, real-time PCR or quantitative PCR, qPCR to measure the copies as they get made. So the more copies you start with, the faster the copies will rise. If you use, um, you can also use reverse transcription qPCR. And so with this, you're starting with RNA and then you're reverse transcribing it. So you're making a DNA copy of that RNA and then you're making DNA copies of the DNA that you made of the RNA copy. So this is giving you a way to count the number of RNA copies that were there. And this is one way that we can measure gene expression because the, the, if we use this for, with messenger RNA, so messenger RNA is the copy of the, so you have a gene that gets transcribed into the messenger RNA copy of the recipe. And then that gets given to the ribosomes, which make it and turn it into protein in translation. So there are a lot of different ways when people talk about measuring expression, they can, they're different, because this expression of a gene, so basically making this product from the gene, it's going to be regulated at various levels. So you have regulation at the transcriptional level, so how much messenger RNA gets made. To study this, we can use techniques like PAL2 chip seq. Um, so RNA um, polymerase 2, so this is the one that makes the messenger RNA copies. We can basically look at where it's bound and sequence where it's bound. So chip seq, um, this like chromatin, um, uh, amino precipitation and sequencing. The basic idea is that you can cross-link the protein to a product, you can cross-link proteins to DNA. Um, so cross-linking, you're making these like strong covalent links. Often this is done with like formaldehyde or UV light. And cut up around them um, so that you don't have like giant strands of DNA. You just want to isolate the region that the proteins are bound to. Then you can use an amino precipitation. So you take an antibody that's specific to one of these proteins and then that you're interested in, then you precipitate out that protein. So basically you, have, you can have some sort of bead or something that's attached to this antibody. So you can separate out that protein and then see what it's bound to. And so there's various mod ways of doing this and various um, variations of this technique, but that's the basic idea. You can also do things um, to measure the messenger RNA levels after the transcription. Um, so this can include RTQBCR, which we've talked about, Northern blot, which we've talked about, microarray. This is where you have, you're looking for lots of specific messenger RNAs. And so you have a like an array. So each well is kind of like a little Northern blot happening, but it's like a well in a plate. And then RNA sequencing, where you basically sequence all of the RNAs that are there. These RNAs though are then subject to regulation so you can have regulation at the decay level, and you can have regulation at the translational level. You can measure res you can measure translation with methods like polysome profiling and ribosec. Um, so with the ribosome or ribosec is sometimes called like ribosome footprinting. Um, so you use these basically you want to see you stop translation such as with cyclohexamide, then you break open the cells and remove the membrane gunk. And then you use RNAs, so RNA cleaving and enzymes to cut up around the ribosomes 
um, so that this is, you want to isolate the sequences that they're bound to, and then you can extract the RNA that they were standing on and sequence it and see where they were bound. With polysome profiling, you can um, basically want to see whether how actively messenger RNAs are being transcribed. So this is looking at where the ribosomes are bound, and this is looking at how many ribosomes are on each DNA, it, on each RNA. So typically you, se you separate them in this, in a gradient, um, like a sucrose gradient or a glycerol gradient. Um, and then you can extract the RNA from the fractions and see, um, so they have more messenger, the more ribosomes that were on a messenger RNA, the, the like heavier they're going to be, the farther they're going to sink. Um, we call these like polysomes. And this is typically means that they're like actively transcribed. And so we can see how many ribosomes are on each mRNA. So ribosome footprinting and profiling are ways that we can measure, express, measure translation. Um, you can also have protein degradation. You can look for this using things like ubiquitin, inhibit, like protease inhibitors, and also seeing if proteins get ubiquitinated, um, which is a signal for degradation. So um, then you have, if you want to measure protein levels, we have Western blot, which we've talked about, and that's going to look for specific proteins. If you want to look at all proteins, you can use mass spectrometry or mass spec. And basically what this does is it takes all the proteins and it chops them up into these short peptides. And then it measures the mass to um, charge ratio of all those peptides and compares it to a big database of all the possible peptides um, to see what proteins they came from. While we're on the topic of this like amino precipitation, you can also use like IP like pull downs or co-immune precipitation, various things that you might see this called where you actually you want to you use an antibody against something to see what it is bound to. So you immunoprecipitate it and then like with co-IP, you're looking to see what it was bound to. So you can then like run a Western or something um, if you were looking for protein-protein interactions, or you could run like a Northern or a Southern if you're looking for protein for what RNA or DNA that protein was bound to. Um, so, or you could do like PCR, there's a bunch of different methods, um, but relying on this ability to immunoprecipitate or use an antibody specific to one thing in order to get information about what it was bound to inside of a cell or that sort of thing. Okay, so often when you're doing techniques, you want to be able to purify that RNA out. And so, or even in various other techniques, you want to be able to extract and purify RNA. So I have a post on how we do that using this like um, phenylchloroform method. It's a bit of a pain, um, but it allows you to get your RNA uh, nice and pure. Okay, so sometimes you want to radio label that um, RNA as we've talked about. You can also radio label DNA. I just did a post on this the other day. Um, we can easily do it using this, um, if we want to do a five prime end labeling using a um, like polynucleotide kinase, it's a simpler reaction. If you want to label the three prime end, that's gonna be a little more complicated. You can also do like body labeling if you're doing some sort of in vitro transcription or PCR based method where you have like, um, you can put in radioactive nucleic acids or you can use like radioactively labeled, um, you can end label your primers um, to get your PCR products radio labeled. So various ways to do that. And so radioactivity is really great because it's super duper sensitive. So when you do one of those labeling reactions, you then typically do a desalting reaction. Um, just these little micro spin columns are really great for this. It, they're these little like gel filtration columns. So it's gonna capture really tiny stuff in here and then your bigger stuff's gonna flow out. And so this, in this way, you can kind of trap the ATP and various salts in here, and then your, um, your stuff should come out um, without those. So those, these are very helpful. Okay, so moving on, molecular cloning. So cloning sounds like this weird, scary term, but really it just means that we are, basically we're taking a piece of DNA from its home and sticking it into a piece of DNA that's easier to work with. 
often we're doing this um, and then when we make this, we're basically, because we're recombining these pieces of DNA, we call this like a recombinant DNA. And if we make protein from that, we call it recombinant protein. This is really, really helpful because we can then put the instructions for making protein into a, um, into like a vector um, backbone. So this is going to, a vector is going to allow us to use it as a vehicle to get into cells. So for example, we can stick it into a plasmid and then this plasmid, so the circular piece of DNA that can live in bacteria and then the bacteria will make lots and lots of copies for us. We can also get the bacteria to potentially make the protein for us, or we can use those, we can use it just for the cloning process and then transfer the protein um, and then do the expression in a different type of cells like insect or mammalian um, or yeast cells. Um, but often we are doing this cloning, at least this, this part, and it's getting the DNA, lots of copies of DNA made using bacteria and using a plasmid. To actually get the plasmid into bacteria, we call this process transformation. A common way to do it is with heat shock and chemically competent cells. So we take these bacteria cells that are basically um, they're being chemically weakened and they have this calcium coating their surface that's going to help this negatively charged DNA get close because this calcium is positively charged. Um, then you do this heat shock and you kind of open the pores in these bacterial walls that's going to allow the allow them to allow this DNA that's now close to sneak in. Um, you can also use electroporation to do this. Um, and then you grow it, you add some food without antibiotics, and then you um, let it outgrow, so let it heal a little. And then you let it grow on media containing antibiotics. So antibiotics, typically what we do is we have our, on our plasmid, in addition to the gene of interest, we have the instructions for making anti antibiotic resistance. Um, um, like protein or something. And so basically what happens is that if your plasmid is in the cell, so if your transformation worked, then the bacteria that contain the plasmid will be able to survive in the presence of the antibiotic, whereas bacteria that didn't take in the plasmid won't. And so we can use these antibiotics as selectable markers to select for the plasmid that took things in. Um, and so another we can also do like blue white screening. So screening your basically with selection, you're only you're weeding out things that don't didn't work or whatever. With screening, you're basically saying, show me what worked and what didn't, um, or what likely worked. So basically in this blue white screening method, you can do this so that you're when you do the cloning, you're actually inserting your gene into this other gene that's needed in order to make this blue product. And so if you have interrupt, if your cloning worked and you inserted your gene into that blue product, that, um, that gene that was needed for the blue product, then you're not gonna see blue. Um, and so then your white colony would probably have your insert because this is telling you whether the plasmid got in and this is telling you about like whether the insert got in. Probably, um, we'll get more into the details in a second of the how what we need to check. But so transformation is one form of transfection. So transfection is just when we stick genetic info into cells. So when we do it into bacteria, we call it transformation. When we do it into other types of cells, we can call it transfection. Um, when a virus does it, we call it transduction. Um, so you can use viral delivery methods or you can use non-viral delivery methods such as um, these heat shock which we talked about, electroporation, so basically using electricity. Um, cationic carriers, so polymers such as PEI, so cationic means they're positively charged. DNA and RNA are negatively charged, so these positively charged polymers are going to kind of help neutralize it, allow them to get into the cells. You can also use lipids, and this is sometimes called lipofection, so the lipids are kind of like the membrane, and so they're going to allow it to kind of sneak into the membrane, disrupt it, um, and then viral delivery methods like adenoviral vectors. Okay, so we get the plasmid or what we get the vector into with the thing. Um, so we'll talk about doing this into bacteria, so our transformation. Now what happens is we want the bacteria are going to make lots of copies of it. So we've selected for the ones that have the antibiotic resistance gene. And now the bacteria are going to make lots of copies. 
We then want to isolate out those, purify out those copies, which we can do with a mini prep or an alkaline lysis. So these are these typically come in these kits made by like Kiogen or Kaijin, I don't know, but they also have like a bunch of other brands make them. Um, I think that mini prep is probably proprietary, but everyone just calls them a mini prep as far as I know. But anyway, so basically you want to take this bacteria, so you take a colony from the plate. So when you do a plate, um, so typically when you do the cloning, then you plate it out on a, like a Petri dish with an agar Petri dish with antibiotic. Bacteria that are able to survive are gonna like land in one spot and then they start growing. Um, and so when they're multiplying, they're kind of like doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling on top of themselves, making this gloopy dot. Um, each of these gloopy dots is called a colony and it should be genetically identical. You can then pick colonies. Um, so take like a little pipette or something and just take this up and put it in some liquid media. So some liquid food. Um, just in like a small scale, like five mils. Let this grow overnight and you can isolate out those cells, um, break the cells open and purify out the, um, the plasmid um, with these kits. Typically they uh, have like a spin column in there. Um, they're fairly easy to use. When you get that, you then want to, so you isolate your plasmid and now you want to see that your cloning actually worked. There are ways that you can test, um, get a quick idea, such as with analytical restriction digest, um, where basically you're using restriction enzymes. So these, DNA, these enzymes that recognize specific sequences in DNA and cut them based on how many cut sites are located inside of your insert, inside of your plasmid, the size of those pieces that you would expect. You basically add these enzymes, you let them cut, and then you look and see if the pieces are the size that you would expect if your insert was there. Another method is colony PCR, where you have primers that are going to basically give you different size products or no products at all, depending on your, how your strategy is in order to see if the insert was probably there. I say probably because in either of these techniques, you're only looking at like a single site or you're looking at the size of the products. You're not looking at the actual sequence. And so there could still be like typos. So often what we do is you do one of these in order to get an idea, but then you send it for sequencing to be really, really sure. And to be honest, sequencing these days has gotten so cheap that a lot of times we skip this cloning, this um, the analytical digest or the colony PCR step and go straight to sending some of these clones for sequencing. So we pick like three to five and send them for sequencing. If, so uh, with just one note, for the analytical digest, you typically, you do a mini prep first, with your colony PCR, you can actually go straight from the little gloopy dot. And so what you can actually do is you can do the colony PCR and the mini and start a colony for a mini prep at the same time, then only move forward with the ones that had a positive result on the colony PCR. So with DNA sequencing, there are different methods, but often we just send this for like Sanger sequencing, which is base, it's just a sequencing method. There are also other sequencing methods. So now um, some of the people in our lab have started using like nanopore to get the sequence of the entire plasmid. These are just different sequencing techniques, but with the Sanger sequencing, you're gonna end up, they'll send you some sort of thing like this, where you get these chromatogram, these trace files um, showing you the difference from the sequence. And then you can look and see if it matches what you would expect. And the places to really watch out for are the ends, and also look at, and speaking of like the, in, the places where you put the gene in, like the slice sites, not slice sites, so I shouldn't use the terminology like that, but the places where your gene meets the insert and where you were making the changes. The ends of the traces are gonna be more noisy though. Um, so don't trust the things at the very end. So it's important to look at these trace files and you can look more in this post for more. So there you want to make sure that there's no, no un, undesired changes, but sometimes you want to make changes. And so you can use a technique called site-directed mutagenesis. Methods include quick change, or what I use is like slick-based methods, where you can introduce specific changes into the DNA. And then you can use that in order to make specific changes to the protein that gets made eventually. When you're working with DNA or RNA, you often want to measure the concentration you can do this with UV spectroscopy because the bases of DNA and RNA absorb UV light. 
And then you can use a device like a, some sort of classical um, spectrophotometer where you have like a cuvette um, or, and you then like say you dilute your sample into a bigger volume or you can use a nano drop where you just stick a drop of this onto a um, little pedestal. Um, which is slightly less accurate, but you, it's a lot easier. Um, but the basic idea is the more the DNA or RNA is there, the more absorb, it'll absorb the UV light. And so the higher the signal, then you can convert that to get the amount of the concentration. Um, proteins also absorb UV light. And so you can use UV to measure protein concentration as well. With nucleic acids, you're typically measuring at 260 and with protein, you're measuring at 280. Um, just that's just where they absorb most strongly and most specifically. There are also other methods for measuring protein concentration, such as BCA, Lowry, um, fluorescent dyes, and Bradford. Um, and so this is Bradford's going to be a colorimetric method. That this one is one of the most frequently used, and I have specific posts on those. Um, and I have a link to that in the protein expression and purification page, I think. One reason you might want to be measuring protein and nucleic acid concentrations is if you're trying to study how protein and nucleic acid interactions, um, as well as, or like protein-protein interactions, various things like that. And so I have a whole post of, of different approaches to studying these. Um, a couple of the approaches for protein nucleic acid interaction. So we've talked about, so you can have like chip seek based methods. Um, what I did a ton in my PhD was this, this like slot blot double filter binding assay, where you have these two membranes. The top is a nitrocellulose membrane that binds protein, but let's do unbound RNA. And then you have a nylon membrane at the bot underneath it that's going to bind to any RNA. So you mix your protein and your um, labeled RNA you mix, um, you let them hang out, and then you see how much was bound by using this like vacuum apparatus to suck the liquid through. And then the protein and any bound nucleic acids will get trapped on top. The free ones will flow through. You can do this with a range of concentrations and then see the, um, like the, the amount that was bound versus unbound and get information about the binding affinity. So how strong the binding was. With uh, another similar-ish method in terms of you're mixing your protein and your nucleic acids, EMSA, so an electromobility shift assay, um, sometimes called a gel shift assay. Here you're looking, instead of separating the protein and the RNA or the DNA um, with these membranes, you're running a gel and then if the RNA or the protein if the, or the RNA or the DNA was bound to the protein, it's going to travel slower through the gel. And so you'll see a shift. And then you can um, do this with the range of concentrations again. If you want to find things that bind things, um, phase display is this really cool method for this. This is often used for discovering antibodies that bind specific things. In this case, you make a library of millions of different phage clones. So this phage is this, this um, virus that infects bacteria. It has this coat protein on its surface. You can actually stick a bit of a protein or a bit of um, some um, like a peptide or a little um, a small protein onto the end of this. this and then the pet, this phage is going to display this from its surface. So you can stick in like a whole library of different proteins that you want to test um, or different peptides that you want to test. And then these phages will infect bacteria. And then they are going to display this protein. And then you can see if it binds various things. Then you can isolate out the phage and of the ones that bound and see what the gene was. Um, and then you can make lots of copies of that and study it and do cool things with it. Um, so more on that in the phage display post. This is actually won a Nobel Prize um, a little back. Um, so yeah, now we're in this kind of like random method section. So one another random method is DNA fingerprinting. Um, so this is like that when we're talking about the analytical restriction digest, but you can use this to um, see like variations in, um, this is used a lot for like genetics, relying on the fact that people have different lengths of DNA segments within, when there's like a repetitive region. And so if you were to cut with restriction enzymes, 
outside of that region, you have different lengths. Um, and so you can use this to as markers to track um, gene, um, genetic inheritance of things and that sort of thing. Um, a lot of times now you have like PCR based methods and with like single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. So more on that too in that post. Um, a meth another experiment that I did a ton in undergrad or not undergrad in PhD um, was a kinase assay. And so um, kinases are proteins that add a phosphoryl group. So this big bulky phosphate onto things. So I was studying a protein kinase. So it was adding a phosphate group from ATP onto a protein. Um, and so if you want to measure that, one of the ways is if you radioactive, use radioactive ATP where this phosphorus is radioactive. And now the things that get phosphorylated are going to be radioactive. And so you can measure that radioactivity. And a way to measure this radioactivity that I used was this liquid scintillation counting. Um, so basically I would spot my sample on a little filter paper and wash it off, and stick it in this little liquid vial. Um, and then this would give off, it would kick the, in this, this scintillation cocktail. It has these molecules that will capture the energy from the radioactivity um, and give it off as light that gets measured by the machine. Um, so more on that here, a really cool, um, really cool, really old school machine um, that I had a lot of fun with. Okay, so well, no matter what type of experiment you're doing, you need to make sure that you design it well. Um, so I have a post on experimental design, making sure you have um, the right variables um, controlled for, um, replicates, various stuff like that, as well as advice for actually performing the experiment, preparing for it ahead of time, performing it, um, staying calm, um, and then writing notes up for it afterwards. Also, no matter what experiment you're going, to, you're doing, you're going to want to make sure that you actually, um, you're going to probably make a, need to make a lot of solutions and buffers. Um, so I have posts on those things as well, as well as a post on the various laboratory equipment um, that you'll be using when you're doing these sorts of things. Um, and so a lot of times too, with these experiments, you'll need to do like serial dilutions. And so I have a post on that as well. Basically, you're, this is when you're doing like a half to a half to a half to a half to a half. Um, and it's a lot more accurate and easier than if you were to try to calculate out the constant, like mix each of these individually. Finally, on this page, we're talking about some structural biology techniques. So with structural biology, we're looking at the shape of molecules and or their form and looking how that, to, how that form is going to um, relates to their function. So I like to give the analogy of a Swiss army knife where if you know about the what the various parts of the Swiss army knife look like, you can get information, you can predict what various parts would do. And then using like site directed mutagenesis as we talked about and that sort of thing, you can make changes to those regions that you would expect and see if you see the expected changes. So that, um, so in order to actually be able to see the form of the protein or the nucleic acid complex or the whatever, um, so it's typically like a protein, a protein nucleic acid complex, and then just nucleic acids, we can use various techniques such as exocrystallography, cryoelectron microscopy, um, NMR. Um, and so this basically cryo-EM and exocrystallography are the, like the two main ones. So with X-ray crystallography, you basically get these proteins to crystallize. So to come out of solution in this orderly way um, where each of these are frozen in like the exact same position, then you um, use X-rays, you shine these X-ray beams at them. The X-rays are going to interact with the atoms in the protein or in the other molecule. And then they're going to diffract. Um, so basically they scatter these rays. These rays then interact with one another and you get this series of spots called the diffraction pattern. Um, and then using a bunch of complicated math in the computer, thankfully, the computer does that work. Um, you can work backwards from that spots to get information about where the location of the scatterers. And so then you can build in this like atomic model of the protein structure. With the cryo-EM, um, here the particles don't have to freeze in that perfect orderly manner. Instead, you kind of freeze them in this vitreous ice. So this really thin sheet of, um, of like liquid, it's like this glass. Um, and then 
you take a ton, ton of pictures and then you average all together all of the different proteins and all of their different orientations um, to get information. So cryo EM, um, it's getting better and better. Um, we have this like, it's just um, based on basically a lot of advances in the technology, um, the detectors, that sort of thing. It's still best for bigger things. Um, I mean, like it's better at bigger things than smaller things. Um, the benefit is you don't have to get them to crystallize. So crystallization, getting proteins can crystallize can be really hard. And so I have a bunch of posts on the various ways, the various methods to get proteins, to try to get proteins to crystallize and trying out a bunch of different conditions that are going to opt um, make that possible. Also just say that like, so although cryo EM, um, it, there's been a ton of advances and sometimes it can be really, really helpful. It's not always as easy as it looks and the sample quality is going to be a really, really big thing. And so the protein expression and purification is going to be really important and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but it doesn't work for everything. Don't, just don't expect it's as easy as, as you might think based on like headlines in the news or whatever. And also don't think that X-ray crystallography is dead um, it's still very, very useful, and it's very, very useful, too, if you already know the conditions for getting something to crystallize. So if you have a protein and then you want to see if it binds various um, drugs, if you already know how to get the protein to crystallize and you can even like soak in the various drugs, various things like that. So crystallography is really, really helpful. Um, NMR can be helpful in some cases. So NMR, um, nuclear magnetic resonance, is basically like an MRI scan. And so it works really well for like little, little um, flexible things. And you can kind of get this like ensemble. It's a solution-based method. So you're not getting anything to like freeze or that sort of thing. Um, so instead, because these proteins are moving around a lot, you get this ensemble where you kind of see like all these different positions that it's in. Um, so, but it can be very challenging and it's good, only good for like really small things. Um, and you need a lot of protein in order to do it. Another solution-based method um, is HDXMS or hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry. Um, so I had a lot of this in my, um, my PhD stuff as well. And here you're, measure, you're not getting a structure, but you're getting information about the structure. So it works really great as a complement to techniques um, that actually look at the structure. And it can give, even give you information about regions that you couldn't see in these structures. So basically, although you can get this overall structure, there's often regions of these structures. When you see one of those like pretty diagrams, like those ribbon figures, those are models. And so those basically, that's not the raw data. And they're, these the models are, the data gives you like the idea of where the signal's coming from. Um, and then the model, you have to, you actually build in the position based on that. So you might get like this map or this, um, where you have this kind of like meshy looking thing um, or this blobby looking thing. And then you have to actually build in this atomic model into it. There's some nice regions that because they're really flexible and moving around, you can't actually reliably stick the position into that. You can't model it in. But you can still get information about it for, with a technique like HDXMS, where basically you're using deuterium, so you're using heavy water, um, and it's going to exchange hydrogen in the backbone of the protein. And but if those regions are involved in like a strong secondary structure, so they're tied up in these like alpha helixes or beta sheets, or if the solvent can't get to them, then they're gonna be protected from this exchange. And so you can then measure the regions that were protected um, and get information about the secondary structure as well as whether things were bound in places. A lot of these posts have accompanying videos and you can find them all in the playlist on YouTube. So I have my, I'm on YouTube as the Bumbling Biochemist. And I have a playlist of lab techniques and equipment with lots and lots of different posts. So as going back to how, what I was saying about how all of those structural biology techniques rely on having um, nice protein and other, other techniques as well, it's really important to have nice pure protein for a lot of experiments. And so I have a whole page, page on protein expression um, and purification. So first I have like a overview post with from beginning to end of recombinant protein purification workflow. So remember recombinant, we're recombining the genetic information for one thing with another thing. 
So we're putting the instructions for making the protein that we want into some sort of vector and then getting cells to make it. Things don't always go according to plan. And so if you have to um, need to be troubleshooting and that sort of thing, um, I have this post here. And so these two are right at the top because you often, know these are the most important, um, but the various steps along the way. Um, so when we're talking about protein purification, we're often talking about protein chromatography. So with protein chromatography, the idea with the chromatography is that you have two phases. So you have like a stationary phase and a mobile phase. In this case, the stationary phase is going to be little beads called resin that we have filling these columns. So these columns can be like plastic or glass pre-packed or you pack yourself. And in, basically in this resin is going to interact differently with the proteins. And so your proteins are in a solution. They're in this like mobile phase and they're going to be traveling through. And so you take a solution containing the proteins and you send them traveling through these columns and they're going to interact differently with those call with the resin. And then this is going to allow you to separate them based on things like having a unique feature, like an affinity tag or based on their charge or based on their size. And so um, affinity chromatography is where you're getting something to stick um, often specifically because they have some certain feature um, like an affinity tag. So when you're doing the cloning step, you can stick a little extra in front of your protein. This is going to add on an affinity a tag that you can then use a resin that specifically binds to that tag. For a ex common example is a his tag. So you stick like this sequence of histidines, so typically like six state histidines onto the end of your protein. And then this is going to bind specifically to this two nickel. Um, and so if you have these beads that are conjugated or attached to nickel, then the beads are bound to the nickel and then your protein binds to the nickel that's bound to the beads. So your protein gets captured, you can wash everything else off and then you can compete off your protein using a midazole, which is basically histidine, but just this, um, this just ring part. Um, and so it can compete off your protein and then in the absence of all these other proteins. Um, another affinity tag that's often used, this is one that I use the most with is this like strep tag or this twin strep tag. It's just another tag. Um, and so it's a sequence of amino acids and it get bind to strep tag in resin. Um, so the same sort of idea, except here you're competing it off with other dysiobiotin um, or biotin, depending on your beads, um, typically dysiobiotin, unless you're using these special beads that are like, because you have to use a harsher uh, method for the biotin to get it off. So with these techniques, um, we're often doing these with like gravity flow. I like to do these capture steps with the gravity flow. Um, so when you because at this point, basically, you break open your cells and you have this lysate that's all goopy and gunky. Um, and so this, um, I find it easier to do in like batch. So mix them in the, with the beads, let them hang out for a while, and then let them flow through a column. You can also use like a pre-packed column. Um, and I use these pre-packed columns. Um, you can use them on this ACTA or another um, FPLC machine. And basically, this is going to send the buffers traveling through the columns and then out um, through a UV detector. Remember, proteins absorb UV light, so you can see the proteins coming off. And then they're going to go into a fraction collector. Then you can look at where the peaks were and then collect the fractions that corresponded to the protein. So in addition to being able to use this for these affinity methods, you can also use it for other types of methods, such as ion exchange, which I guess is the kind of affinity method, um, and size exclusion. So with ion exchange chromatography, you are basically, you have beads, you're separating based on charge. So proteins have different charges, and you can take advantage of this by using different beads that are either positively or negatively charged. And so if you have a cation exchange, you use this for if your protein is positively charged, um, you have this negatively charged resin, your protein binds, then you compete off with salt. Um, anion exchange is basically the same idea, but opposite. So you have a positively charged resin and then um, use this if your protein <clears throat> is negatively charged. Um, and I should say too, that this is relying on little regions of positive or negative charge. And so it doesn't mean that like your protein has to be positively charged over, um, everywhere, that sort of thing. Uh, much more on that in my post on the ion exchange chromatography. 
Um, but so you can put like two different buffers in your act. You can have like a buffer A, which is no salt, and then a buffer B, which is high salt, and then have it mix them together. So you can get like a gradient or you can do a stepwise elution. Um, the stronger <clears throat> that it's bound, the more salt it's going to take to compete it off. You can also change the pH to get it off, but typically we use salt because you don't want to change the pH typically when you're working with the protein because they're picky. Okay, with size exclusion chromatography, here you're separating based on size. Um, so the beads have these different pores, and so the smaller the um, proteins have access to more pores, and so they're going to travel um, more slowly because they have to travel more distance. Um, and so they're going, the bigger things are going to come out first is a basic idea, and you can learn more about it in this post. In addition to doing it for purification in order to like clean up proteins to get separate the big and the little things and isolate one of them. You can also use it for like analytical, so mixing proteins together or proteins in DNA or RNA together and seeing if they, um, if they co-elute. So if they are then going to come out together, so showing that they're binding. Um, and you want to have more information about working with an acta, reading these chromatographs, more on that in this post. Okay, in order to get that protein though, you need to actually express it. Um, often this is done in bacteria with this like T7 promoter system. So this is really helpful because it allows you to induce the expression by adding IPDG. It relies on this bacterial lac repressor system. Um, so basically this lac repressor is going to bind to in front of on the promoter that's going to, and this is going to prevent the polymerase that's needed to make the mRNA to make this protein um, from being expressed until you add IPTG. IPTG is going to bind to the repressor and get the repressor to fall off. Now you have your T7 polymerase um, get made and you have the, now the T7 polymerase is going to be used to make messenger RNA from the, um, of your protein of interest and then that protein of interest will get made. Um, and you can get a lot of protein made. Um, but going back to why we have that troubleshooting, bacteria don't have all the same equipment as our type of R cells. Um, so if you have a protein that's more complicated, needs modifications, needs like specific chaperones, so like things that help it fold, then bacteria might not work. Um, a technique that I use a lot is using this um, insect cell expression. This is done with this backmate expression vector system or BEVS. Um, and so it's going to, you basically make this backmate. So it's this plasmid that has the instructions for, it can replicate in bacteria, but it can also replicate in insect cells. And when you put it in insect cells, the insect cells can actually turn it into a whole virus. Um, and this virus infects other insect cells. And then those all have the instructions for making your protein. And so they make your protein. There are also methods that are cell-free. Um, so some of these are lysate-based. So basically you break open cells and then you make it in, in the broken open cells. So common methods for this are bacterial, wheat germ, rabbit reticulocyte, or other cell lysates. There's also reconstituted from purified components or the pure system. And this is like what it sounds. You've mixed together the various things that you need for making a protein, um, ribosomes, amino acids, that sort of thing. Um, and make it like that. What's really cool about this is that you can adapt it so that you can use non-canonical amino acids. So amino acids that wouldn't normally get added, you can add um, in there and trick them into adding them. Um, so you can introduce cool things. Okay, um, so speaking, even if you, so sometimes this will, you have to actually like change the codon, like the cell so that they're trick them into using a stop codon for an actual codon for this unnatural amino acid that you add in. Various cool things like that. Um, you can also, basically speaking of codons, sometimes if a protein isn't expressing well, you can optimize um, for the cell type it's in. So different um, organisms stock up on different tRNAs. So the tRNAs, so the same amino acid can be spelled by multiple tRNAs, which are going to bring the Forms the connection between the codon and the messenger RNA and the, um, and the amino acid. And so different amino acids can have multiple different codons. And so you can, but cells keep different amounts of those different ones. Um, and so by using the ones that the cells use most, 
you might have more success in getting your protein expressed because they're not like going around trying to find the TR, waiting for the TRNA to come. It's only like a rare TRNA to come. You can also um, use like with, for bacteria expression and stuff, there's like rosetta strains that have extra, um, that have like extra copies of the rare ones in like a plasmid in the cells so that they'll more likely make them. So that way you're changing the cells rather than your codon sequence. Okay, so now just some like random things. Um, so ultrasonication, this is often used when we're doing helping break open or lice cells as well as shearing up the DNA. Um, so DNAs can be big and gloopy and so you can um, shear them up into smaller pieces um, using ultrasonication. Use this batch um, or this bassonicator. Um, use this like probe sonicator where you stick this probe into the liquid, it's going to make these high energy waves um, and these waves, so give you this like area of high pressure and an area of low pressure. And those are going to, bubbles are gonna form in the areas of the low pressure and they're gonna collapse because now a high pressure area hits them. And so what's gonna happen as they collapse this um, like gaseous cavitation, they're going to release these shock waves. And then these shock waves are going to shear up the DNA and help you break open the cells and stuff. Um, another thing you often do when you're purifying a protein is dialysis. Um, and so dialysis is a way you can like desalt and buffer exchange and stuff. You basically take this membrane pouch that your protein can't get through, but little stuff can. And then you stick that pouch inside of a big bath that has a liquid that you want the protein to be in. Um, then that liquid is going to, and the, the salts and whatever that's in the liquid, those are going to go in and the salts and stuff that are in the pouch are going to go out and they're going to reach this equilibrium. Um, and then you exchange the water and then you exchange the water and then you exchange the water um, so that the equilibrium keeps being, being reached at the point where the solution that you want is in with your protein. You can also do um, buffer exchange or gel filtration using um, the desalting columns. So we talked about these a little before. We're talking about RNA purification or labeled reactions purifications, but you can also use it for protein and often they have like bigger size ones you can do for a protein. Um, and a disadvantage of this versus the dialysis, so this one's a lot easier, but you um, lose more. Okay, so protein concentrating, this is kind of similar to dialysis in that you have a membrane that your protein can't get through. But here, what you're doing is, these are often done in these like spin concentrators. Um, sometimes there's like vacuum methods, but basically you're pulling the liquid through and not letting your protein through, and so you're concentrating it. If you want to measure the concentration, then I have posts on measuring the concentration, um, as I mentioned in the previous um, page. Um, I also mentioned page in the previous page, so SDS page. And then um, flash freezing of your pure protein, so typically we add a little bit of cryoprotectant, something like glycerol. And then we flash freeze it in like liquid nitrogen. So we cool it really quickly because we don't want ice crystals to form inside of our protein um, and then like damage them. So also on my YouTube, I have playlists for recombinant protein expression as well as protein chromatography. So that was just like a whirlwind overview. And so, but each of these places, I have links to whole posts where you can learn more about these various things. And hopefully that was helpful.